What is going on, everybody? Jamie Shaw here on the Absolute Basketball Experience. Today, we bring you session two of the Absolute Basketball Coaches Corner. Today is Chuck Martin of the University of South Carolina, where he talks about relationships. He talks about he doesn't want to recruit the player. He wants to get the player. He talks about building that and how he went through the process uh, of building relationships. He gives tons of stories, tons of anecdotal information, um, very in-depth. Uh, the Q&A part's great. Everything about this is, is very, very good, very educational. Chuck's very articulate in, in teaching uh, and talking uh, on this subject. Uh, and he has a great background coming from coaches, from uh, Eddie Sutton to um, John Calipari to Frank Martin to Tom Crane, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes in uh, about qu uh, stuff about all of them. Before we get into it, we ask that you subscribe to this channel, give this video a thumbs up, and if you enjoy the information, please share it across your platforms. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and in the comments below, if you would, go ahead and leave a topic that you would like for us to talk about on a Coach's Corner. Have a coach come in and talk about a topic. Leave that in the comments button below uh, after you subscribe to the channel. But without further ado, here is Chuck Martin of the University of South Carolina on session two of Absolute Basketball Coach's Corner. Thank you very much. All right, what's up, everybody? Thank you all for joining us today on the Absolute Basketball Experience Coaches Corner. Uh, it's a free educational time for coaches at every level. Um, you know, we do this uh, weekly. Uh, next week, we're going to start doing it three times a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Um, the next one's going to be on this Thursday. We're going to have J.D. Byers of VCU coming on to talk. Um, so go ahead and mark your calendars and spread the word and, word and everything, 2.30 on Thursday. But for this time, we have Chuck Martin of the University of South Carolina. Uh, Chuck's in his third season here at USC. Uh, previously, he was at Indiana, and before that, he was the head coach at Marist for five seasons. Um, he is a Bronx, New York native. He played and graduated from Monmouth University, coached the likes of uh, Derrick Rose, Chris Silva, Yogi Ferrell, Thomas Bryant, Troy Williams, Chris Douglas Roberts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he spent his time also previously, Memphis, St. John's, Drexel, uh, UMass, Manhattan, coaching with Frank Martin, Tom Crean, John Calipari, Norm Roberts, et cetera. So we're very excited to have Chuck on today. His topic is building relationships uh, with the motto, I don't want to recruit the player, I want to get the player. So without further ado, here is Chuck Martin. So how we're going to do this, Chuck's going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes. And then after that, we're going to open it up to everybody for a question and answer. So think about your questions and stuff, and we want y'all to be very interactive and to ask uh, tons of questions and all that kind of stuff, too. But without further ado, here is Chuck. Man, I appreciate that, Jamie. Um, again, I apologize to you guys. I had, um, had some issues this morning, but we got through them. And uh, as I'm looking at the screen, I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, some guys I've known for a number of years, some guys I've, I've met recently. But anyhow, this is, the, this is the start of my fourth season at South Carolina, but the beginning of my 22nd collegiate season, um, which is amazing to me because years ago, I just thought I was going to be a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher for seven years. I taught uh, four years at LaSalle Academy in the Lower East Side in New York City. And then I went back to my alma mater and taught three years at St. Raymond's High School. Uh, in the Bronx. And, and I was I was happy. I was content uh, doing that. And then I got the coaching bug like most of us do. And uh, before you know it, I got my first job at Manhattan College with a guy named Bobby Gonzalez. Then I hooked up with Bruiser Flint at UMass, followed him to Drexel, went back to New York City, St. John's, uh, hooked up with Cal at, um, at Memphis, got an opportunity to be a head coach at Marist College. And then I was out for a year. And that year was a critical year for me because I spent the year with the Oklahoma City Thunder. I was not coaching. I was in the front office. And that helped me um, pivot in how I gather information and how I use it to my advantage or our advantage in recruiting. And then I hooked up with uh, Tom Crean after the OKC experience at Indiana for three years. And here I am at South Carolina. So that being said, in my 22 years, um, the one thing that really stands out is um, information is key, right? Which, which I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know that. As you're trying to build a program, you're trying to establish relationships, 
you're trying to recruit, you're trying to get that player. Um, information is key, but he here's the, the thing that I've learned. It doesn't come with instructions. And that's really, really critical. Like information doesn't come with instructions. So if you misuse it, you don't know how to use it. You don't even understand that that's critical information. You, you're dead in the water. You're not going to win that battle, that recruiting battle. You're not going to get that guy. Um, <clears throat> the second thing, right? So the first thing is it doesn't come with instructions. That's on you to try to figure out how am I going to use this information to my advantage to, to build that relationship with the family, with the kid, with the high school coach, with the AAU coach, with the community. The second thing is, which is really critical, which is fascinating to me, and, and I think I learned more about this, this concept through OKC when I spent time with um, Troy Weaver and, and Sam Presti is that information doesn't come with, with a warning sign. Like, like, there's no heads up. It's not coming tomorrow at 10 a.m. So it's unpredictable when it comes, and it's unpredictable in the form it takes. So, for example, you walk into a gym and you're going to recruit this big-time player that you think is going to help your program, and, and immediately there's a bias, and you look at two or three guys, and you pick one or two and say, those are the two guys. For whatever reason, in your mind, those are the two or three guys that are going to help me with the information. Meanwhile, the guy that really controls the room is a five foot nine. 120 pound sophomore who's the manager he knows the deal so information comes with no warning and it comes in different packages and you've got to be alert to that you got to be aware of that and if, if you're not aware of that information is going to just kind of you know come and go without you even realizing it, it it's right in front of you um <clears throat> and as i mentioned earlier it, it's it's unpredictable information and that's, that's, that's important. It's unpredictable in every sense of the word. Um, when they're going to share it with you, um, how long it's coming, um, who it's coming from. And, and, and here's, here's the thing I learned with the Thunder, and Sam Presti shared this with me. He says, if, if you're in traffic, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking back, it was a few years ago, so, you know, I'm paraphrasing. If, if you could just put yourself in traffic and just stand in the middle of traffic, information is swirling all around you. It's all around you. You just got to open your ears and open your eyes. And, and, and people may not be having a conversation with you, but they're having a conversation that's important to you. They may be talking about a kid that you're recruiting or a family that you're recruiting that they're unaware that you're recruiting them. And all you got to do is just be in traffic. Just stand in traffic and information is swirling all around you. And you just got to just take it all in. You don't even have to interrupt that person. And, and in many cases, in my, in my opinion, when you interrupt someone from sharing that information, they become guarded and then they don't give it to you because they, they may have a vested uh, interest in, in, the, in the fight. So sometimes they're, they're having a conversation with another person and you just happen to be a fly on the wall. Just hang out on the wall. Hang out on the wall and take in all that information. So it's unpredictable. You don't know when it's coming. Um, I got a few notes here, so just bear with me. Um, this is really critical. And I think, I think again, I credit this to, to the Thunder. Um, they were just real generous in allowing me to to be a part of it and, and showing me how they do it. How you organize the information will determine whether you're successful in getting the prospect. So how you gather that information is going to determine whether you get the prospect or not. For example, we're, we're all busy. I, I'm, I'm, I'm married. I've got a 22 year old daughter who's graduating in a, in a few weeks. I got a 17-year-old son. I got a 15-year-old son. Like, we've got a million things going on. So if one of you guys were to share something with me, I'm, I'm trying to create a habit of immediately, the first 15 seconds that you tell me that information, I'm writing it down. Because 
after 15 seconds, generally, that information gets lost or, 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 or it becomes a different story. So, so what happens is what you thought you had at three o'clock becomes distorted by 3.05, which then becomes confusing by 3.30, which then you mislead your head coach or you mislead yourself if you are the head coach. So, so the minute you say, if Sam says to me, Chuck, like, hey, man, I, I can't recruit this kid because he's, he wants to play at the highest level or a higher level or, or whatever, and he has an uncle in Charlotte, I'm writing that down immediately. Because if I don't write it down, between the time that Sam shares that information with me, my wife is calling me, my son wants me to rebound for him, my daughter's asking for help. And by 3.30, I think Charlotte is, you know, Raleigh. And I'm trying to track a guy down in Raleigh that does not exist. And as I'm doing that, the other teams in our league have beat me to it, and, and I'm on the outside looking in. And that's how quickly it happens. So, um, so again, the, the guy or team or staff that organizes the information the best is usually the, the, the guy or team that, that wins that battle. Um, and, and this is one that's really interesting. And for some reason in, a, in my mind, just be, I, I grew up in New York in the Bronx before I'm older than a lot of you guys. So there was no ESPN and, and there was no, you know, cable and all that stuff. It was like the six o'clock news, the seven, the 11 o'clock news. And in my case, I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in New York. It was like the, the Spanish channel. That was it. So at 11 o'clock, right, right before the news, or at 11.25, right before the news would end, they would show the ticker at the bottom of the television set, the, the, that, the, uh, the stock market. And I was really, really young. And I didn't really understand at 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, exactly what the stock market was. All I knew was that someone won today and someone lost today. Because there would be an arrow pointing up and an arrow pointing down. And then the next day, the same companies who were winning were losing. And the teams that were losing yesterday were winning today. That being said, information is like the stock market. At 3 o'clock, you tell your head coach, we're in. We're going to get this kid. At 3.15, if you're not, if you're not vigilant, if you're not careful, if you're not doing all your due diligence and you're not watching that stock market, that kid has already committed 15 minutes later to someone else. So information is like the stock market. What is true today may not necessarily be true tomorrow morning. And what is true tomorrow morning may not necessarily be true tomorrow evening. There's no absolute in recruiting and there's no absolute in information. It's a running tab, and your responsibility is to, to keep tabs on it, watch it, look at it, analyze it, organize it, and then with the understanding that it's unpredictable and, and that it can change at any given time. So I, I think that's really important. Um, the other point I want to make, which has changed from the beginning of my career um, to, to, to the present time is is the amount of false information. So that makes it really, really hard to try to establish relationships because you don't know what's real and what isn't. And, and that, that's really, really hard with social media. Um, and, and to me, that's why I think it's critical that you have relationships um, with, with, with uh, players, coaches, communities, and not just try to recruit them. If you, if you just try to call someone when you need something, you're gonna get false information because they're, they're looking at you saying, all you do is just want, want, want. You gotta have a relationship with those guys. You know, it's amazing to me, this is my 22nd year and every place I've been at, um, they're always reaching out to the alumni asking for money. You know, can I have a million dollars? We're trying to, we're trying to build a new facility. My question is, have you ever called that guy before? 
did you ever talk to that guy? Did you wish him a happy birthday? Hey, happy anniversary? Or is this the first time this guy's ever heard from you? Because if this is the first time he's heard from you and you're asking for a million dollars, that guy's hanging the phone up. That guy's not interacting with you because you're not invested in him. There's no relationship. You're just trying to recruit him and you're not trying to get him to be a part of your community. Um, and I think that was kind of the, you know, Jamie and I talked about, about um, you know, recruiting versus getting him. And in today's day and age, I think it's a fascinating, to me, I'm corny that way. I think the dynamics of getting someone and recruiting someone are like on the opposite spectrums. But, but what's interesting to me is that coaches and programs are being celebrated for recruiting a kid and not getting him. So for example, if a kid says, I'm, I'm releasing my top 10 tomorrow, that's immediately on Twitter and everyone celebrates it. Man, he made the top 10, he made a top five, but only one school and one program is getting that kid. That's it, just one. So the other nine guys, they wind up getting someone that's really good, but they never, they never get acknowledged. The other nine guys never get acknowledged for the work that they've done. It, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. So for me, when I go into the recruiting process or, you know, we're trying to get a guy, I don't want to recruit that kid. I want to get him. And there's a different mindset. There's a different attitude. There's a different approach to getting someone as opposed to recruiting him. I don't want to be in the last two. I don't want to be the last three. I want to be the last man standing. That being said, you've got to, you know, make sure that all your intel, all your information that, sh that you've already done the legwork. So now you can walk into your, your head coach's office and say, we can get this guy. And then he's going to ask you, why do you think you can get him? And then you, you can support that with intel that you've already gathered and say, this is why we can get this guy. Now, I'll give you an example. When I was at Drexel years ago, I'm working for Bruiser Flint, and we're looking for a point guard. And there's a kid named Jose Juan Barrera down in Miami. And he's J.J. Barrera. And, and he's putting up some numbers, I mean, some ridiculous numbers against some high-level talent. I mean, 15 assists, no turnovers, you know, 25 points. And he's doing this over and over and over again. And I'm watching him on film, and he doesn't pass the eye test in the sense that he's not a great athlete. He's not playing above the rim. He's not blowing by anyone. But he, he's playing with incredible pace. And I, and I watch the film, and I'm saying, that dude can really, really play. That guy's a high-level guy. But there's no one else recruiting him but Drexel and some mid-majors. So I jump in and I said, let, let me try to gather as much information as I possibly can so then I can go to Bruiser Flint and say, Brew, this kid is better than any kid on the East Coast. I don't know why they're, they're not recruiting him. I don't know why they don't view him that way, but he's better than any kid in Philly, any kid in New York. So anyhow, make a long story short, I realized that at that time, there's a guy named Frank Martin who's at Northeastern University in Boston. And I know Frank at the time. I've known him for a long time. And I'm saying, okay, Frank Martin is of Cuban descent and the high school coach is of Cuban descent. The AAU coach is of Cuban descent. JJ Barrera is born in Puerto Rico, but I couldn't gather the information fast enough and quick enough and organize it well enough for me to get to Puerto Rico and beat Frank. And the minute I knew that Frank Martin was involved and that he had been involved for a month or so, I knew I was in trouble. So at that point, I pivoted. I, I continued to call the kid and I touched base, but I knew in my heart of hearts, I'm just recruiting that kid. I'm not getting that kid. And I wasn't into recruiting him. I wanted to get him. So we moved on and, and got someone else. Um, but, but I think that's, that's, that's one of those examples of, of like, you, you got to do your homework and, and, and get yourself organized before the battle even begins. If you're trying to, if you're trying to organize that information on the fly, then it's really, really hard because recruiting, as you guys know, moves at such an incredible pace that, you know, it's just, it's just too much. It becomes overwhelming. Um, that, that being said, you know, I think it's important for all of us when you don't get J.J. Barrera. It's not the guy that you don't get, because I wish we got him, because hell, you know, it turned out to be pretty good, right? But it's not the guy that you don't get, it's the guy that you get that can't play. And you're married to that guy for four years, because you panic. You panic and you say, 
I missed out on a point guard. I got to go sign someone because my boss is on my ass or because I want to be on Twitter and get acknowledgement that I recruited someone. So you sign a guy that can't play. And, and, and I've kind of, someone taught me that early on in my career. Uh, Bobby Gonzalez was the first guy I worked for at Manhattan College. And he would say to me, it's not the guy we don't get, Chuck. It's the guy that we get that can't play. And that stuck with me my entire career. And that held true at Drexel. We didn't get J.J. Barrera, but we wound up getting some really good players who helped that program get to three Colonial Finals. And at that time, it was a one-bid league. So, you know, we, we didn't go to the NCAA tournament, but we did go to three NITs, which for us was an incredible feat uh, because we, we came from, when we got the job, we were, at the, we were in the American East. And so we leapfrogged from the American East um, in April to, to the beginning of the season in October uh, to the Colonial. So it, it, was, it was a huge leap for us. But we were able to, um, again, when we missed out on a guy, we didn't make a mistake by taking a guy that couldn't play. You know, so it's not the guy that you don't get. It's the guy you get that you're married to who can't play. And then, and then you can't get mad at that guy because you offered him the scholarship. You didn't do your homework. You didn't evaluate well enough. And, and that's on you. So now you've got to figure out a way to develop him, improve his whatever God-given talent he has. you you got to make the best of it at that point. Um, so I don't know, man. I've been, I've been rambling uh, for, for a few minutes here, and, um, and I'm hoping that what I'm saying and what I'm sharing, I'm articulating it well enough for you guys to get. And, um, and then, you know, maybe we can interact now. If you guys have any questions or, or some of your own stories, maybe, maybe this is the time where we can kind of go back and forth. Yeah, so let's go into um, <clears throat> some uh, question and answer here, guys. We're going to let you police yourselves. If you have a question, uh, if you would, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it. And let's, you know, try to, I don't want to say be civil or whatnot, but, you know, one at a time and, and do all that. I'll go ahead and start with the first question and get things rolling. And then uh, we want a ton of interaction, guys. So please go ahead and jump in. We'll do this for about 20 or 30 minutes or however long it takes. Um, so Chuck, you have worked with, worked for, um, some of the big personalities in college basketball, you know, Frank, Tom Crane, uh, John Calipari, Bruiser, um, all that kind of stuff. They all work in different ways in recruiting uh, and getting players and stuff. What are some differences that you've seen in the recruiting process and all that kind of stuff between each coach that you've worked for? Well, really, is a, it's, a, uh, it's, a ref, it's a good question. It's a reflection of, of the time. So, so my answer is going to, uh, diff it's going to be different depending on who the coach is. So, for example, when, when I was at Memphis with, with Cal, you know, we were in Conference USA. And that was not part of – it wasn't a Power Five conference. Uh, Louisville had left. Cincinnati had left. Marquette left. All those teams left for the Big East. And so it was hard to, to say, hey, we're, we're, we're a big-time program. So, honestly – Cal, Derek Kellogg, John Robick, Rod Strickland, we just, we were creative. And, and one thing that we did was the one and done thing, which, is, which is, a, is, is amazing to me, the one and done thing was essentially almost created at Memphis because we couldn't recruit, we couldn't beat Carolina in recruiting. We couldn't beat Duke in recruiting Kansas. We would walk in the gym and I would say to Cal, like, like, we can get that guy. And the minute Carolina, Duke, and those other guys walked in, it was like, all right, let's roll. And I'm like, wait a minute. What are you, what are you talking about? Let's roll. We, we can get this guy. Cal's like, we're not beating those guys. Let's roll. We're, we're out of here. And really, so the one and done thing was really a, a concept that was created. And, and really what it was, it's like, look, we had a kid named uh, Darius Washington. Little point guard was pretty good. And, and ourselves, our, our pitch was – was to the, to the upcoming guy, the next guy was, was, hey, Darius is going to the league. Like, because he wanted to go to the league. He wanted to go and play. But we don't know that at the time. But he winds up having a pretty good career. And, and he, we had another kid named Rodney Cart, uh, Cartney from uh, Indianapolis who also left early. And, and what we realize is when the kids leave early, you know, how are we doing this? How are we recruiting at this level, at this pace? And what we, what we attempted to do, and again, there was no – there was no game plan at the time. 
we tried to tell kids as you're recruiting who felt the pressure of, of the, the power five schools, Hey, commit, commit, commit. We went the other way. And I think this is where I think Cal was really, really good. We went the other way. We said, no, no, don't, don't commit now. Like take your time. There's a big decision for you. And really we were hoping that we had a really good season and that the season became an infomercial for us and that the, the season was an infomercial for the kid. So now Derek says, I'm actually leaving. And it's like, great, we're going to go get Derek Rose. So you get Derek and you try it again, and you're like, I don't really know if this is going to work, but whatever. We ain't beating Carolina, Duke, and Kansas straight up. So let's try it. So here comes Tariq uh, Evans, and he's got all these schools, and we're like, everyone's pressuring him. Like, hey, man, sign now. We're going to move forward and sign someone else. And we went the other way. We said, no, 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 take your time, big decision. Watch, watch what happens to Derek. And we got lucky. We had a great year, go to national championship game. It became an infomercial for us. Derek leaves early, here comes Tariq. Man, we're on to something. We're on to something with this one and done thing. And then here comes the next guy, John Wall. Yo, yo, hold on, don't sign early. So at the time, it was, I guess the concept of the idea was, was, was I don't want to say created, because, you know, I'm sure other coaches were thinking along the same lines, and, and we weren't the only ones. There are a bunch of really good coaches and really good recruiters. But for sure, I, I felt like we were on to something with, the, with, with delaying the commitment of kids that we weren't going to get early anyhow. We weren't going to beat Carolina. But Carolina was going to move on and get someone else. And Duke was going to move on and get someone else. And Kansas could afford to go get someone else. So by us slowing the process down, we were allowed to be the last man standing and signing him in April. Now, that was in 2008, 2006. Um, things have changed, you know. Um, at, at Indiana, it was a little bit different. We were able to uh, evaluate, I think, better than most. I thought Tom is incredible. Tom Crean is, to me, in my opinion, one of the better evaluators in the country. So when we took OG Ananobi, people laughed at us at Indiana. They couldn't even pronounce his last name. They wanted us to take a kid from the state of Indiana who was a really good player. And I get it. It's Indiana, the Hoosier State. We should take the in-state kid. But OG Ananobi wound up being the 23rd pick in the first round after he was injured. If he were not injured, he would have been a lottery pick. And, and OG was told by a number of schools that I won't repeat that he was a Division II, Division III center. And what we saw, we saw a six foot eight wing who happened to be the biggest guy on his team. And that's why he's playing center. And so we would, Tom was meticulous at watching high school film, even if the film was awful. And no disrespect to the high school, some of the film was awful. You know, like you just, it was grainy. You can't really see it. You know, it's shadows, you miss possessions. But we were meticulous at watching the film and evaluating. And the one thing we kept watching was a six foot seven guy outside the three point line making threes. And we're saying to ourselves, that guy is not a center. That guy is a guard who happens to be six eight. So at IU, we evaluated better. And OG Ananobi is an example of that. Jawan Morgan, I think, was a top, top, I don't think he was a top 50, top 150 player. He was maybe top 170, top 175. And he just signed with the Utah Jazz. He's another kid we took because we evaluated differently. You know, we, 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 we didn't just recruit him. We, we, we said, let's out-evaluate the other, the other guys in the league and the other guys in the country. So IU was different. And then, and then Frank, I think, is super underrated. Um, I, I think what Frank has done a great job of, and, and I'm still learning, he does a phenomenal job of getting the guy that fits him. That guy can be a guy who had no scholarship offers, none whatsoever. And Dwayne Notice was going to, if I'm not mistaken, Duquesne. Dwayne Notice became the catalyst for that Final Four run because he was by far one of the top five defensive players in the country. But he was going to Duquesne. And people thought that that was a stretch for him, that he couldn't play at Duquesne. But Frank said, that guy fits me. He fits our program. He fits our culture. And I think Frank is, is unbelievable. He's great at this, at not budging 
and not panicking when other people criticize. He ain't good enough. He's not big enough. He's not fast enough. We, we, there were a handful of kids in state who were really good players, and they wound up going somewhere else. But we got A.J. Lawson and Jermaine Cousinard, who are two of the better guards in the SEC. Those guys fit us. Those guys have a chance to help us win a lot of games. And those guys have a chance to move on and play at the next level. And, and so, so I think I'm learning after 22 years in the profession, I've learned a ton from Frank in the past three years. Don't panic. Don't worry about rankings. Like, do your job, evaluate. And does he fit your culture? Just because the kid is bigger, stronger, faster, rated higher, he does not fit us, don't take him. And I think too often we, we want um, the acknowledgement that we can get a kid, that we can out-recruit someone. And you do. Every once in a while you wind up getting that four-star, five-star guy. But he does not fit you. So you don't, you don't have the season that you wish you could have and that kid doesn't have the impact that you thought he would. And, he, and maybe he would somewhere else, but not in your culture. I don't know if that makes sense. I thought it was great. Anybody I else can, next up? I can ramble on, too. So if I'm talking too much, just tell me, Chuck, shut up. Be quiet. No, you, Be quiet. Your answer has been great so far. Um, um, any, anyone else? Any, anyone anyone else? Any, any, yes. Uh, uh, good morning, Coach Martin. Call me, call me Chuck, man. Coach Martin's oh. for the old guy, man. <laughs> Still young. Good morning, good morning Coach Martin. Um, how's everyone doing today? I hope good. well. Um, my name is Antoine Wade, and I'm a student assistant coach at USC Aiken. Yeah. We're a branch of uh, USC. And right now, I'm, I'm 27 years old, but I'm very young in the coaching of collegiate. And I started out being the manager. Uh, my first year, next year I became the student uh, coordinator, and now this year I'm a student assistant coach. And I just wanted to ask uh, maybe one or two questions. But my first question was, when you first started coaching at the collegiate level, what were some of your duties or what was your job? Man, you know, I was doing everything. I was doing bet checks. I was driving. You know, when I started out, I was at Manhattan College which is in, in really in the Bronx, in New York. And so you would play the local schools, which is, you know, Iona, uh, Fordham, St. Francis, Brooklyn. I, I was the coach. You had a scout. I would drive the van. I would park the van. Um, I, you know, it, it was, this is 1999. So like, like we didn't have a Nike, Adidas, Under Armour uh, uh, contract. So it wasn't like they shipped the uniforms to you. I had, I remember driving like three and a half hours with who's my wife now, my girlfriend at the time, to pick up the uniforms for the season in some factory like outside of PA. And, uh, and that was the deal. That was like, look, man, we, we need you to go pick up the uniforms. And, and the thing was, I was happy to do it. I, I, was, I was a part of it. Um, I didn't know any better. Like, I, whatever the coach asked me to do, I was all in. You want me to drive three hours to go pick up the uniforms, I'm good. You, I remember driving from New York uh, in a prism. Some of you guys are too young to even know what a prism <laughs> is. I don't think they're new prisms anymore. Prisms have no stop, no, no power steering. Prisms have like, like, you, like you had to struggle to turn. I drove from the Bronx to Oak Hill Academy with Steve Smith for a kid who, who committed to us, and he was going to take the SAT the following day. And I drove up there because our head coach wanted me to give him encouragement. For some reason, in his mind, he thought that me hugging him and saying, you can do it, that he's going to score higher. So I drove with no GPS, by the way. Like, there was no <laughs> – like, I'm, I'm from the Bronx, man. I'm like – I'm in, oh, you know, Mount the Wilson. I'm lost. And all I'm thinking is I go there, I hug the kid. I, Yo, man, you can do it. Like, like, hey, man, this is awesome. I believe in you. And I never forget Steve Smith's wife saying, you know, are you staying nearby? I said, no, I'm driving back. She bust out laughing. She couldn't believe it. She was like, why would you drive back? I said, we got individuals tomorrow at 6 a.m. It's like a 14-hour drive. And Steve and, and, and Lisa said, you better, you know how to get out of here? Because once it gets dark, and I never forget this, I was driving so fast because I just needed to get to the major highway. Because if I didn't get to the major highway before it got dark, I was in some serious trouble. So 
whatever the coach asks me to do, whether it's pick up the uniforms or go drive to Oak Hill to hug a kid because for some reason he thinks that my positive energy is going to help him on an SAT. But that's what I did. And, and again, it, it was normal. It was, I was young. I didn't know any better. And, and I'll add to that. On that staff who did what I did and more with no complaints, with no issues, is the current head coach of the Denver Nuggets, Mike Malone. Mike Malone, start, Mike Malone and I started together at Manhattan College. We didn't know any better. So, you know, Mike would drive two hours to pick up sneakers. I would drive three hours the opposite direction to pick up uniforms. We would stay in uh, the office. We had what we called the breakfast club. So we get in at 6.30 a.m. And then there was a running joke. I'll share the story with you guys in New York City. The word got out that Mike Malone, that our head coach wanted us to be relentless workers, like outwork everyone in the country. And we were young, so we didn't know any better. So Mike and I would get in at 6.30 in the morning, work our tails off. Right around 7.30 in the evening, we would play one-on-one. -on -one and then just to kind of, you know, break up the monotony of the day. And then that would take us to about 12.05, five minutes after midnight. And the word would get out in New York. So what started to happen was right around 12.07, we get a phone call in the office. And Mike and I were young, so we would answer the phone, like, with unbelievable enthusiasm, like it was 9 in the morning, you know. Jasper basketball, you know, it's like midnight. We done worked like 18 hours. And it would be silence on the other line, like no one's talking. And then that would happen for like two or three weeks. And then Mike and I never really thought much of it. You know, here, three weeks into it, again, right around 12.05, Mike and I pick up the phone, Jasper basketball. And finally, we could hear somebody in the background laughing. And then another guy yells out, it's true. They do stay after midnight. Holy shit. These guys, <laughs> these guys are in there. Bobby Gonzalez has got these guys uh, working 15, 16 hour days. And later on, we found out who the high school coaches were. But to, to make a long story short, if it meant stay after midnight, if it meant get in at 6.30 in the morning or drive three hours to PA to pick up uniforms, that's what we did because really, at the end of the day, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a coach. And that was the price to pay to be a coach at Manhattan College. And there was no negotiating that. There was no compromising that. And I think I sound like an old guy now because I don't know if I see that, maybe because I'm a little bit older and, I'm, and I'm a little bit more removed from the high school coaches and I, I need to re-engage with high school coaches and reconnect with younger guys. But like none of that stuff was, and you got no credit for that. It wasn't on Instagram. <laughs> it wasn't on Twitter that I drove three and a half hours to pick up uniforms. So you just did it because that was the, the price to pay at Manhattan College if you wanted to be there. If you didn't want to be there, you didn't have to be there. You, you know, you could just go be a teacher or do something else. But, uh, but that, those are the things that we did. We did everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate you. Um, what about, what about you guys? What, what are some of the things that you guys have challenges with in recruiting, um, building relationships? What, what are the things that you guys are trying to figure out? And how can I get better at this? Coach Martin, how you doing? Cool, yeah, we're doing. So, Court, Court. I'm doing pretty good. Um, I just had, had a question for you. Just to piggyback off what you said about recruiting. So obviously, so obviously you've been at Manhattan before in Drexel, which is which wouldn't be classified as the most appealing school to to attend. Um, so I would like to know. I know it's it's been a while, but the best way that that you sold your Manhattan or Drexel to to a recruit. That's a great question, man. For me, and I think it's just part of my personality. The glass is always half full. It's never half empty. And for me, like you can wake up every morning, regardless of where you're at and whatever situation you're in, you can wake up every morning finding something wrong. It's your responsibility to wake up every morning trying to find something right. What, what's right here? What's good here? There's something good here. There may be some challenges, but there are some good things. And you know, Manhattan College, hey, it's New York City. We play at Madison Square Garden. We get a chance to compete against St. John's. We get a chance to compete against Seton Hall. Those opportunities exist at Manhattan College because of the location where it's at. Um, the gym becomes a part of our advantage, not disadvantage. It's a small gym, so when we press and we get after you, the pressure's on the opposing team, not on us. 
at, at Drexel was funny because we were literally across the street from Penn. And Penn, as you guys know, has probably the most historic arena in the country in the Palestra. And I didn't, I was younger and aggressive and we played there once a year. And Fran Dunphy was the coach at the time. He was awesome. I remember calling him or one of his assistants and Penn is literally across the street from Drexel. I, I would ask him, you okay with me bringing the recruits over to Penn and show them the palestra? And, and he was awesome. So, you know, I didn't know what he was going to say, but he was generous enough to allow me to do it. So all of a sudden, not only did we have, you know, uh, our arena where we played at, which was small, I was selling the idea that twice a year, which was true, we played at the palestra. You know, where else can you do that? We're going to play Villanova at the Palestra. We're going to play Temple at the Palestra. And it was a matter of, of seeing, you know, the, the glass half full, not half empty. Yes, there's some challenges at Drexel. Yes, there are some challenges at, uh, at Manhattan. But it's your responsibility to wake up and, and, and look around and say, okay, there's something good here. I got to find it. And then I got to be able to sell that. Got you. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, thank you. Coach Martin, Sam Ferry, Chuck. Chuck. Look, Sam, yeah, I'm, young, man. I'm, I'm fighting it. I'm young. Call me Chuck. Man. Thanks. Thanks for being on here, Jamie. Thanks for putting this together. Um, you know, you're just talking about how you were talking about how you organize information can determine whether you get a kid. What, is there anything in your time with the Thunder and how they organize their information that you were able to bring with you back to college that's served you as a coach? Yeah. Um, uh, some of the things that they do. Um, here's the one thing I'll, I'll start with this in the pros. It was so different because there was only one, there was only in college. There's, there's this expiration. There's this, this, this pressure of signing someone early and signing someone late. So what happens is as you get closer to November and you haven't signed anyone, you start to panic. There's this false sense of pressure. Same thing applies, you know, in the late signing period. So I think that the one thing I learned right away is don't panic. In the NBA, there's no early or late draft. There's only one draft, which gives them the luxury of saying, I liked them in September. I did not like him in October. I loved him in November. I hate him in December. I love him again in January. Because really what happens is that's, that's a fact. And, and too often what we do is, we say, I hate him, he can't play. Well, how do you know he can't play tomorrow? How, how do you know that? Like, well, we, we, we immediately, we, we dismiss him because he's not big enough or strong enough or fast enough. Well, that, that was his sophomore year. What about his junior year? What about the beginning of his senior year? What about the middle of his senior year? So I, you know, I, I learned that from Sam, like what's true today is not true tomorrow. So kind of, you know, what we did was, and when I try to do is I try to jot down all those, all those moments in my notebook. I like Sam today. I love him tomorrow. Not as good the next day. And then at the end of the day, when it's time to make a decision, you've accumulated a body of work. You, you put together a hundred pieces, whether it's um, when I was with the Thunder, I, I must've written like 300 scout reports. And what happens is that there's, there's, 20 of them for one guy. And then somewhere lies the truth to Sam Decker. I love Sam Decker at Wisconsin. I hate Sam Decker at Wisconsin. He's okay today. He was great tomorrow. He was awesome in the tournament. Not as good against Purdue. And somewhere, in be, somewhere lies the truth. So if, if you can, can kind of just jot it down, whatever your opinion is, jot it down, because at the end of the day, you're going to have a, a collection of opinions. And all you got to do is look at the data and you're, you're going to say, I liked him more times than I didn't. I'm taking that guy. Um, I thought that was helpful. And I thought, I thought Sam did a great job, which I think is really hard for college coaches um, because in college, you're trying to recruit them in the NBA, you're drafting them. But I thought Sam and Troy did a great job of creating an, an, a safe uh, environment and safe space. And what I mean by that is we're all on this uh, conference and I say, I love Jordan. I can't get mad at you if you say you love LeBron. I can't get upset with you. I can't, I can't say I'm not going to lunch with you tomorrow. And that often happens with college staffs. It's like, like we're recruiting. We're trying to improve our program. 
We're trying to get the best player that we can get to help us win a conference championship and a national championship. Um, if you happen to like a guy that I don't like, we, we got to create a, a safe space where I allow that argument to, to develop. I got to allow that space without anger and then without being spiteful. And I think too often among college coaches, um, that happens a lot on, on staffs. I've been fortunate that that has not happened in my 22 year career. I've been really lucky that way, which then allows me to express myself and express my opinions without, without someone shooting me down. Because what happens is if you don't allow that space and you shoot, if I shoot Sam down because I don't agree with him, then Sam essentially starts to hold back information because he's afraid that he's going to get shot down in the meetings. And then in a critical moment where Sam is, is like, he's on it. Like he, he's done all of his due diligence. He knows this kid inside out. He's about to change the trajectory of our program. He won't say anything because you shot him down eight times. And he, he's tired of being beat, beaten up in the meetings, so he won't share it. So then the other school gets him. And then you don't even realize why you didn't get him. And I think Sam did a great job of putting us in a room, and there was no judgment. Chuck, what do you think of, of, of Decker? I love him. I hate him. Great. Troy, what do you think of him? And, and it was okay. It was okay to disagree. It was okay to, to not see it through my eyes. And, and you shouldn't have to, to try to justify your opinion. This is what I think. This is what I see. These are, this is based on the games I've evaluated. And someone says, well, I don't agree. Okay, cool. All good. It's okay you don't agree. It, it now challenges me to maybe reevaluate my, my assessment of the kid. And that doesn't happen as often in the collegiate ranks as it does. I mean, it does happen more in the collegiate ranks where there's a disagreement. Part of it is, um, and I don't, I don't know how to word it, so I'm just going to say it. Um, coaches who, who don't know any better and they, they're trying to figure out a way to move up in, in, in their careers, they think they got to kill the other guy to get acknowledged on Twitter or social media and get credit for recruiting that guy. And that's the only way I'm going to move up. So the pressure of, of um, self-preservation, right? The, the pressure of like, I got to add value to me does not mean you got to kill him. And that's a hard thing to do because we're all trying to move up. We're all trying to, we're all trying to, you know, get raises and get better jobs and, and all this other stuff that comes along with it. Um, but I think that's one thing I learned with the Thunder. It was like creating a, a, an environment, a safe space where you and I could talk about it without anger and without being spiteful the next day. And I don't know if I answered that question or not. No, thank you for that. That's really good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, any, anyone else? Any other uh, thoughts, ideas? And, and if, if there's anything I'm sharing that doesn't make sense, just, you know, just say it because I won't be offended. I won't be offended if I'm not ar articulate something uh, well. Good morning, Coach Mark. Mark. Morning, morning. Good morning. Great insights. Uh, thanks for putting this on, Jamie. This is a lot of help. Have two quick questions. One question is What advice would you have for young players who are talented but are not necessarily getting the help from their recruiters or, or trainers? What, what advice would you have for them? to kind of get their name out there and contact, you know, coaches and that type of thing. And um, the next question is, how has this current situation affected recruiting, your recruiting, mm -hmm. um, in, in this April period? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the good questions. The first question I would say is, you know, control the things you can control. There's certain things that you can't control, and that's hard to, to accept when you're a 15, 16, 17-year-old kid who feels like he should be recruited higher or, or have more traction or have other schools involved with him and he's not getting the traction that he wants. Um, control the things you can control, which means continue to get better, continue to work on your craft, continue to uh, improve. Um, and, then, and then again, with today's uh, technology, I think you can, you can, and you can do it in a way where, where you're not turning people off you can get your, your material out, you know, whether it's game footage, um, uh, AAU footage, high school footage, try to get it out there. Again, technology allows us all to do it. And then guys like Jamie, I think, have done a, a great job of, 
of um, sharing that information with guys like us so we can see these kids who maybe don't, don't have the opportunity to, to showcase their talent. So technology, I think, is a great way to do it. Um, but I do think if you're the kid, you've got to be completely honest with who you are and what you've done um, to that point. Um, your, your expectations have to match your talent and your, and your work ethic. So, but I do think technology can help. Um, I, think, um, I think your second question, you know, how has this affected us, I think is interesting because it's a great question and it's challenging me to see if, if I'm actually doing all the things I'm preaching. Because I can't go out and see anyone right now. So am I organized with my information? Am I gathering the information quicker than others? Um, am, I, am, I, am I treating the information that you guys are sharing with me like the stock market? Meaning I'm going to bed saying, they told me A, B, and C about this kid, but I know better. When I wake up tomorrow morning, that can be completely different. So this is a great um, uh, time for me in terms of challenging myself to see if I'm actually doing the things that I'm sharing with you guys. Um, and I think the guys who are, who, are, um, who are relentless in trying to gather that information and the guys who are relentless in trying to organize that information, those are the guys who are winning right now. And, and what happens is I think you can make the obvious calls, call the high school coach, the AAU coach, obviously call guys like Jamie, but, but you got to figure out who's the guy that no one's calling, including you. That's the question. Like, like there's some, I, I, I sit at home and say, I talked to this guy. I talked to that guy. I spoke to this person. And then I'll sit there and say, who is it who I have, who have I, haven't I not talked to? Who is that person? And sometimes it hits me right away and other times it doesn't. And I'm like, I can't figure out who's the person I haven't called because someone's going to figure that out. And I, and I think, uh, I think those are the challenges during these times, you know, trying to, trying to figure out who's the guy that's controlling the recruitment, who's the guy that has the most influence, what's real, what's fake news, what's real news. It's, um, it's a challenge for sure, particularly when you're not face to face. I, I don't know if that, if that answered it or not. Answered it or not. I hope it did. I hope it did. What, um, but, um, what about you? What, about, what are some of the other challenges that you guys think about? Chuck. How you doing, uh, Randy? Doing, Randy? Uh, What's up, Randy? So, um, I have a question. How do you feel by the new uh, test scores? How's that going to affect your recruiting ability when you – had somebody that you, was emerging higher, but now couldn't go to a division one because the, the test scores, but now you are, you could get him back. How are you going to go about that? Man, it's a great point, man. So like, it's funny cause I was on a phone call last night and there's a kid who was thinking about going to prep school. And, uh, but now with this new rule where it seems like they're going to waive the SAT, he's saying, I don't know if I'm gonna go to prep school. Cause I don't know if I want a chance take a chance to be forced to take the SAT next year when I can get cleared this year. And so it's, it's interesting because everyone's facing different challenges. And for us, he was a kid that he's not quite there yet for us, but I see the potential in him. So, you know, my recommendation and suggestion is, Hey, go to prep school. Maybe we can get you the following year. But he, he's saying, Hey, with the new rule, I'm going right to college. I don't want to take that chance. So it's, it's a really good question, man. Cause there's a ton of kids who, schools and coaches have backed away because there was fear of, of, I don't know if he's going to qualify and I don't want to be stressed out the entire spring and summer. Um, but now with this, with this new uh, development, you know, it changes everything. Now you're saying that kid's going to qualify. Um, I may take a chance if I've done my background check on him, make sure he's a good kid, hard worker, and he fits our culture. I may take a chance and take him if he's going to get cleared. It's a really good question, man. And, and I'm not sure if, if we've ever seen anything like this before. This is completely different. And then on top of that, add the possibility of, of kids being able to transfer, the one-time transfer rule. So, like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be really, really interesting, uh, kids just kind of moving from one program to another program and then having another group of kids who, who maybe would have struggled to qualify but will, will qualify now. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's a great question, man. 
I don't, I don't know, I don't know what we're going to do, but because we're all trying to figure it out as we, as we go along. But, uh, but it, it's, it's a, it's a challenge for sure. Really good question, man. You got me thinking now. You got me thinking. You got me thinking. Um, uh, here, here's a, here's a, a, a quick, uh, a quick story. story. And then maybe, uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, to it, maybe not. When I was with the Thunder, one of my responsibilities was to try to do some intel on uh, a kid named Dante Exum, who's from Australia. And what happened was Dante played in, in an event, one of those FIBA events, where he played his tail off. And essentially what happened was he was, he was one of the better players in that event. So he was locked in. From that point on, he was locked in, like, you know, first-round pick. So what he, what, he, what he decided to do was – he said, I'm not going to play anymore. I'm not going to play anymore because all I can do is hurt my status going into the draft. So for a whole year, he just, he just worked out in Australia. So all the NBA teams are trying to figure out, well, how good is he? Was it, was it just a, a one week? Was it just two good games? Or is, or is he as good as we think he is? And this is where information is, is, is critical and, and, and it's unpredictable and you got to be ready for it. There's no warnings. My roommate in college is from Australia. And he has essentially a club team that he brings over to the States twice a year, once in the fall and once in the spring. And when he does, he usually calls me and he says, I'm in town if you want to grab dinner. So at the time I'm in New York and he calls me and he says, he says, I'm, I'm, I'll be in town if you want to go to dinner. And I'm saying, I can't, man, I'm, I'm working really, really hard on this project. And he's like, well, you know, we'll just go to dinner for two or three hours. I said, I can't, I'm working on this thing. I got to come up with an answer. So anyhow, a few days go by. He gets closer to his travel date. He reaches out to me again, and he says, uh, hey, man, I'll be landing tomorrow. Again, if you change your mind, I'm staying downtown. We can go to dinner. My response does not change. I can't do it. I got too much work. I love you. I just can't do it. Fast forward two days. He's in New York City. I'm living in New York City. He says, Chuck, I'm in a city. I'm leaving tomorrow. You want to go to dinner? My response doesn't change. I can't do it. I hang up the phone, and, and something's missing, right? Like, like this energy around me changes and it hits me. I'm like, could it be that my, my college roommate who's from Australia, no Dante Exum, that, that, that there's no way he would know him, would he? Well, let me call him. Hey, I got a crazy question for you. Where are you? I'm going to dinner, like I told you, I'm down on 39th Street. I said, I got a question for you, man. And if you answer this question the way I, I'm hoping you answer, I'll meet you for dinner. I said, have you heard of a kid named Dante Exum? He starts laughing. He says, yeah, he works out in my gym every day. His dad and I played together in Australia after his playing days were over at Carolina. I said, what restaurant are you at? I'm coming to meet you. But that's a great example of like, there's information that's in front of me. And I, I was so caught up in working that I wasn't listening. And he's telling me, you know, I'm, I'll be in the city. I'm from Australia. I'm a basketball coach. And it never dawned on me to even ask him, like, do you know Dante Exum? Are you familiar with him? And not only is he familiar with him, he works out every day in his gym. And, and, and that was enough information. And, and really, no one got a chance to see Dante that year. And I didn't get a chance to see him either. But I certainly had an inside track through my old college roommate. And whatever information I gathered, I was able to share that with, with the group, which you know we didn't get him, we didn't draft him, but we felt like gave us somewhat of an advantage. So I thought that was a that was a really really good uh, uh, story, uh, that, story that that took place. That took place. Anyhow, anyhow. Uh, Chuck, real quick, got a question for you. I guess we have a lot of college coaches in here, but we also have a lot of high school AAU guys too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Channeling toward them on the recruiting side of things, what do you suggest high school or AAU coaches do, or how, or methods that they do to ensure that their kids are properly getting seen? And then secondly, you know, with this uh, quarantine and all that kind of stuff, social media has become huge for, uh, you know, recruiting and seeing kids and stuff. Uh, what are some good ways, positive ways that, you know, players, coaches can be using social media to help promote themselves uh, toward college coaches? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, if you're a high school coach, I, you know, bring the kids on campus when it's permissible. Bring them on campus. If we've got a, an elite camp or a team camp, bring them on campus. Um, bring them on campus so we get a chance to get to know them and get to meet them a little bit more. The more familiar we become with the, with the program and the players, the more engaged we become, the more comfortable we become, and then we can start the process. 
Um, I think through social media, you know, again, trying to get your, your high school clips, um, your high school games out there, I think are good. But for me, I'd rather a kid, you know, send me a, a game via email so I can watch the flow of the game, so I can, so I can watch um, not only the things that he did well, but take a look and see the things, the times that he struggled and how he, he recovered from those struggles. So I think social media is great. Um, I, think, I think guys like you do a tremendous job getting names out there. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one on this call who, who reference, who goes to Jamie for uh, intel and information. I know I do. Um, and I think, I think you've done a great job with the kids as well, right? You get their content out. You reach out to us. We, we reach out to you. There's, there's, uh, there's a partner uh, that's necessary, necessary for both of us, both of us. kid and for us. Yeah. Got time for questions here, guys, if y'all want to go ahead and jump on. Hey, Chuck, I got a question. Okay. Okay. Uh, Seamus Bell from the Winchester School. First of all, thank you guys. Jamie and Chuck, thank you guys for coming on. Um, really appreciate it. I was just wondering, um, at a prep school, sometimes uh, it's harder to actually get out and see the kid um, and be able to form a relationship with him um, in person. So I was just wondering, um, how, do you, how do you form those initial relationships maybe when you've only seen the kid and you you can't get to see him personally yet um just over the phone and stuff how do you kind of reach out uh go about forming that relationship when you can't meet him in person that's a great question man i think the first thing that i would do if i'm a prep school coach i'm hitting the college coaches because the, the college coaches that you feel comfortable with that have credibility in your eyes call them hey is there a kid out there that that you would recommend uh you know i'm looking for a guard a big a wing and and because i think most college coaches um can help because we're here. We, we are, you know, our eyes and ears are on the ground and we can share that information with you. Hey, here's a really good player who is not going to go to college next year. And he wants to go to prep school in, in the Northeast. So I would, I would hit all the college guys and ask them for any information on any kids who potentially would want to go to prep. And then I would try to hit the AU coaches and, you know, the AU coaches to me, they, they deal with the masses. So not only do they deal with their 17s, they deal with their 16s, their 15s, their 14s, and then they're friends with the opposing AAU team. So even if that kid is not on their team, they, they, they've got relationships throughout the whole AAU um, uh, world that can help you. So I, I, would hit, I would hit the college coaches and then the AAU coaches and, and hoping that they can give you accurate intel so you can try to formulate a really, really smart uh, opinion on a kid and make a decision whether you want to take them or not. Yeah. Thank you, Chuck. Nah, thank you. Thank you. Hey, Chuck, I got a question for you. Uh, Steven Rexford here. I've been Thanks, with uh, D2 and AAU and uh, most recently joined on into JUCO. Um, I wanted to ask, recruiting obviously is huge. That's a big topic of what's going on today. Right. Uh, but, you know, us part-time coaches or JUCO looking to make it in a four-year what do you, when you're looking for your assistance and looking to hire your staff, what do you look for? How do we separate ourselves aside from the recruiting? Um, you know, I think it's a great question, man. I, I think, you know, whether it's, it's drafting in the NBA or recruiting in college or hiring in college, I think you've got you've to hire, draft, recruit people, not talent. Recruit good people. Draft good people. Hire good people. Obviously, you want them to be talented. Obviously, you want them to, to be really good recruiters and be really good X and O guys, but you, you've got to hire good people. Because if you hire good people, hard workers, you can overcome some shortcomings. You hire a good guy who's a hard worker and he's willing to listen, he can learn how to become a recruiter. You know, I was a high school coach at St. Raymond's and, and, and a teacher, and I planned on being a teacher my whole career. I had no idea about about high school, about college basketball, recruiting. I never took the recruiting exam. I didn't know the rules, I, but I was passionate about it. I, I feel like I'm a hard worker, feel like I'm a good person. And then Bobby Gonzalez, along with the other guys in my career, taught me how to recruit. They taught me how to do individual work. They taught me how to do, uh, um, have a film session or scout report. But, but to me, I think it's really, really critical to have good people in your organization. If you don't have good people in your organization, you got, you got no chance of survival. 
So if you're trying to move up, you're a JUCO coach, a high school coach, um, a Division II coach, you know, it sounds corny, I get it, but like people are watching, everyone's watching. And, and the interesting thing is like Frank, I think is awesome. Like Frank is the best at making you feel like he's not watching. That dude is watching. And he's got a good feel for it. That's a, that's a stand-up guy. That's a good guy. That's a good person. That's someone that I want to be around. And he's a hard worker. I can teach him the rest. So, I mean, that's what I, that's what I would, you know, recommend. And that's what I would look for. You know, is he a good person? Is he a relentless worker? If, he, if he's a relentless worker, good person, good listener, I feel like you can learn the, the rest. All right, guys, we got time for a couple more questions here. If y'all want to go ahead and jump in. Chuck, I got one more question. Yep, yep. How much did Gary D inflate, inflate you in the college career? My high school coach is Gary DeCesar at St. Raymond's. And he, he, you know, it's a really good question. How much did he influence me? He influ influenced me a ton, man, because, you know, back then there was no excuses. There was no, you know, Gary coached us hard. Um, there was no, there was no, like, uh, I wasn't going to transfer. I wasn't going to leave St. Raymond's to go to Cardinal Hayes because he sat me down like that. That wasn't going to happen. So what Gary did was he created a mindset for me. He created an attitude for me. He, he helped shape my, uh, my edge, which is necessary. Forget about basketball, just in life, right? You know, you, you're, you're trying to, you're trying to land a job. You're trying to get a job. You're trying to get a promotion. So my high school coach helped me create an edge. He, 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 let, he helped me understand early on that, you know, you got to fight for what you want. No one's going to give you that. you got to compete for that. And so because he, he coached that way uh, and he held us accountable, there, I didn't view the world any differently. There was no out. There was no, there was no, hey, if I don't like it, I'm leaving. If I don't like it, I'm transferring. It was, if I don't like it, you got to figure it out tomorrow morning. And, um, and you know, and I know times have changed and I know that you've got a, it's not always done one way, you, you, you know, there's different ways to skin a cat, but, but the question is how did Gary DeCesar, my high school coach influence me? That was it. He, he held me accountable and, and he didn't let me um, make excuses and he forced me to confront any shortcomings I had. If I couldn't handle the ball, if I couldn't defend, if I turned the ball over, if I showed up late to class, he confronted that every day. And eventually I had to confront myself and say, no, I'm, I'm wrong. I got to take responsibility for being on time. I got to take responsibility for not uh, turning the ball over. And, you know, those lessons that I learned with Gary, you know, hold true today and, uh, and, and influenced me enough that, you know, it impacted me throughout my entire career. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Yeah. <clears throat> I know I rambled long enough, man. I know I went, I went pretty I far, went but pretty far, but um, um, any anything else by you guys? Yeah, yeah. Well, here's a question from uh, E. Davis. Yeah. How would a college coach go about getting into professional coaching, and do you have any desire or look to possibly go back there? Yeah. Uh, you. Good question. What I would do is, you'd be amazed that you you can reach out to all these guys. So for E. Davis, you can literally email the GMs and the, and the assistant GMs. You'd be shocked and surprised that those guys will return the email, email, return the phone call, because they're in the uh, gathering of information business. So they they don't want to make a mistake where a guy reaches out to them um, via email or a phone call. They don't return it. So so you'd be shocked. Pick up the phone, you know, uh, call, call the office, email them, introduce yourself, um, let them know what your, what your plans are, what your vision is, what you want to do, and, and start a relationship with the guy. And, and most of those guys, guys the you, I would imagine, you, I would imagine, my experience is, if you can get to Orlando, get to Orlando for some of some of you get to Vegas for some Vegas for some of let me know and and just walk over and introduce yourself. Introduce yourself. To yourself. If, if, if you happen to play in your town, and, and, and you know you're free on that particular night, I may be with I may you. Be with you. 
I love the I love stop the stop. Line. Line. I meet you. I meet you. And I, I think I think you're a high school coach, 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 coach or division, or division coach, 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 coach. You you think that it's think that it's fetch, but it's not. It's not. Some guys some guys are like us. They're working, they're coaches, they're just they're, 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 they're trying to get better. They're, they're, they're all about, all about relationships. relationships. And if you initiate it, they'll, it, they'll, they'll be, 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 they All right, guys, time for one more question here. Hey, I, I got another one. I got another one. It, uh, it kind of, it, uh, it kind of, it kind of, kind of backed off an earlier question about, earlier talking about um, high school and prep kids getting, prep kids getting talk, talking to some other coaches in our league, Mike Hart at St. Andrews and stuff like that. Um, we're, we're having trouble placing guys, guys that are scholarship level kids. Um, we're having trouble getting them placed. Um, at D D two D three all all levels. So I was just wondering, um, do you think it's because of the one time transfer rule? Um, do you think it's because of the ease of access with synergy? Um, there's so many guys in the portal. You can just get a kid and have 60 games. Um, I was just I was just wondering what you think. Um, why why it's getting so much harder for a kid in high school or prep school to get get a scholarship coming out? Um, I think the transfer rule for sure, 100. percent So like you know, with the new rule, fifth year fifth year transfers become free agents and, and it kind of goes back to the premise that, that that we started with about an hour ago you know it's not the guy that you don't get it's the guy you get who can't play so if you're going to take a chance let me take a chance on a fifth year uh, senior who at least has some collegiate experience and if he's not good enough then he's gone in eight months anyhow and if I if I'm gonna if, if if I go take a prep school kid who I'm not quite sure whether he's gonna be good enough the first two years, now now you risk the chance of I'm gonna be with him for four years and he may not be good enough and he transfers anyhow. So I, I, I think you you're you're right on it. I think the fact that that you have the transfer rule, the fact that fifth year transfers, I mean, I'm older, so you guys are a little bit younger than me, but like years ago. If you were at a Power Five conference, like you, you probably would not take an Ivy League kid because in your mind you just felt like he he wasn't quite good enough. But Power Five schools are fighting for Ivy League kids, like like they're fighting to get a guy that's averaged nine and a half points in the Ivy League, which by the way is a really good league. So I don't I'm I'm not disrespecting the league or the coaches, the players. But years ago you would go to prep school and go get a freshman. Just go get a freshman who's talented, who has some upside, help develop them, and then by sophomore, junior year, will really impact the program. Well, that's changed because if I can get a kid who averaged nine points, seven points, six points, and I can, you know, help him with our style of play, maybe he can get to 10, 11 points. He's a senior. He's been through this before. And maybe he can help us win one or two games. And if he can't, then I'm not stuck with him. He's going to graduate anyhow. So I, I think I think you're on it. I think that's that's the deal. If there were no fifth year transfer rule, I think you would see more coaches apt to recruit the prep school kids and then offer the scholarships to the prep school kids. And I think that's one of, that's one of the reasons why you guys are having challenges placing really good players, really good students, really good kids. Appreciate you, Chuck. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know if the other coaches agree with that or or disagree with that, but that's kind of what I see. All right, Chuck, I guess that wraps everything up here. Um, unbelievable insight, um, great questions, great answers, and all that kind of stuff. Really appreciate you taking the time to come out. Man, I, Man, I, I appreciate you having me, Jamie, and I appreciate all you guys. You guys. Business, would you like to give, Would you like to tell these guys how they can get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, you can, you can email. You can call me. <laughs> Just call me. Call me. Uh, Jamie, I don't know if you have all these guys' information or not, but you can share my cell number and my email. Okay. And um, if you guys want to guys connect, connect, I'm always here to talk, talk and, and, and bounce and ideas off one another. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll send that out in a follow-up email to everybody who registered. I'll send them out uh, your information and stuff. Um, 
So uh, anything else you want to close with? Uh, if you guys are in town, if, if any of you guys ever want to come to practice or come to a game, you guys are more than welcome. You know, our doors are always open. Frank is great that way. I think he's one of the best teachers that I've been around in 22 years. So if anyone is in town or has a free weekend and uh, wants to come see what we do, we'd love to see you guys. Good deal. Um, guys, make sure you go ahead and mark your calendar now. Thursday, 2.30 p.m., J.D. Byers at VCU. He's going to go over offensive concepts. Um, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, be sure to be on the lookout. Um, Chuck, again, thank you guys very much uh, for coming on. Again, it was, it was unbelievable insight. Um, in case y'all don't know me, I'm Jamie Shaw, the Absolute Basketball Experience. You can see me on Twitter, at Jamie Shaw 5. Um, also, YouTube channel, Absolute Basketball, and podcast, Absolute Basketball Experience. So, until next time, guys, thank you very much.